I tell you what, the world is not going to reset, right? You can't push the reset button on, uh, you know, going back to 2017. I think there's been about six cycles. I wish I could push the reset button on and I wish I knew what was coming because, uh, again, I probably would have invested harder, smarter and faster than I have. So we can't live in a place of regret. We've got to keep moving. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, a code cracker. We're going to dig into some of the challenges people have inside the real estate market today, of course, with bill costs, inflation, interest rates on the move, things are costing more. How do you deliver the best result for yourself in property as an investor? My job, simply to share information. I want to give you some ideas about the real estate market so you can make some bold decisions as to how you go about choosing a property to buy. Should you renovate? Should you pay a premium for a renovated property? Should you actually build? Let's do some pros and cons on all of it. Hey, uh, if it's your first time tuning tuning into the show, make sure you play the show in double speed. I'd love to knock the show over in 20 minutes. I don't think I can. I've probably got an hour's worth of content, so you got to speed me up, get your life back, and of course, uh, all the shows are episodes of or lessons on real estate, so uh, tuck in. Now, I've got a mysterious sunbeam shining on my head. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I apologize. I don't know how to get rid of it. Honestly, I've closed every blind. I've closed uh, all the windows. I'm like, where is this coming from? I cannot work it out to save my life. So I look really weird on YouTube. I've got a big glow um, basically hitting my head. It's like God is talking to me. Maybe, uh, Maybe God is influencing this episode Maybe God's a renovator. I don't know, but uh, I can't remove the sunbeam from the picture. So uh, I apologize if you're YouTubers watching this, but I don't know. I don't know why people watch podcasts on YouTube anyway. I got no idea. Just, you know, I I don't get it, but thank you for watching YouTube people. I appreciate it. Um, If you haven't heard, there are podcasts, so feel free to you know, use your iPhone and and try a podcast. It it might be an easier way to do this, right? But maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I I still don't understand half the things in the world, but certainly today I'm going to talk about real estate. I'm going to talk about the tensions which are unfolding inside the real estate market. There's a lot of tension, is there, at, at times in real estate? And of course, tension is a big part of being a real estate investor because we have to go through a current state of affairs uh, to get to an end place when it comes to real estate investment. And in the middle, from going from a current state of affairs to the end place, which is financial freeman, free, uh, uh, freedom, there's so much tension. I mean, I don't think a year has gone by without tension in real estate. Like for the last 20 years, it's been tense. There's always been something basically meddling with the process of real estate uh, investment, whether it's policies, decisions, whether it's interest rates, whether it's the market being volatile, whether there's been, you know, stagnation in price movement, which often, you know, meddles with people's mojo. There's been all sorts of stuff. Um, You know, obviously, then you've got to factor in people often regret buying real estate. Um, Some people are loss adverse to, to doing anything and get frightened by everything they see in the news. And of course, to be a long term property investor, you've got to go pretty well 21 plus years. And along the way, you're going to feel anxious at times excited and and at times quite desperate as to what is going on. This is the tense place. And I always say this. I mean, I say it all the time. The biggest problem you uh, encounter as a property investor is you buy the problem of time. And along the way, uh, along the journey is this really tense period where uh, a lot of people don't like what is going on and, and really um, – 
get challenged with what is going on because a lot of people don't like change. A lot of people also don't like the stress property puts on their back pocket. Um, They uh, want the financial outcomes from real estate without necessarily paying for the financial outcomes of it. And of course, this can meddle with many people's mojo when it comes to property investment. And of course, for many people just thinking about doing something today that helps them 15, 20, 25 years from now is just too much of a stretch of the imagination, so to speak. And and of course, you know, the bill's in the post, as I always say, for property people or non-investors that, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to pay the tab in one way, shape or form. So, Whether you do it now or you do it later, um, I would advise if you are sitting on the fence being a property investor to do it now. Get involved in property as soon as you've got the financial capacity. Um, No matter if the market's going up, down or sideways, obviously be prudent with what you do when you do invest. Don't be completely irresponsible. Do some education, find a great team, all that kind of stuff. Tick a few boxes when it comes to how you approach being a property investor, but don't cheat yourself out of a big opportunity and get involved in the real estate marketplace when you can. I tell you what, the world is not going to reset, right? You can't push the reset button on, uh, you know, going back to 2017. I think there's been about six cycles. I wish I could push the reset button on and I wish I knew what was coming, Because, uh, again, I probably would have invested harder, smarter, and faster than I have. So we can't live in a place of regret. We've got to keep moving. And as far as when it comes to buying real estate in a simple form, a buy and hold form, uh, there's really four types of behaviors, if you like. Uh, We can look at real estate where we pay a bit of a premium because it's renovated, We can look at real estate which we need to renovate. We can look at real estate whereby we need to do a new build or we can buy something where we do nothing to it and kick the can down the road. Of course, the conversation around kicking the can down the road for many property investors is a favorable one because it means that they can... uh, deal with inflation later and the cost of things is going up and really the conversation around the cost of things moving and uh, accelerating is a big conversation. So I want to have that conversation. I actually want to dig into that conversation and talk a little bit about the compared to what for property investors. Um, what's out there in the marketplace? Do I do a new build? Do I buy a renovation property? How do I approach cosmetic improvements or structural improvements? So we're going to have a little bit of a chat. And I think the first place to start is the Golden Goose, which is a premium renovated property. Like right now, they are hot property. Uh, Today, because obviously a supply chain mess, that property... Uh, investments in with no stock being around. Anything that is basically almost like brand new selling um, for uh, the first time or is, you know, an older property which a extensive renovation has been through, it's in huge demand. Like people are paying a premium for those type of properties. And as obviously renovations are delayed for many, many properties or people can't renovate because there's no trades. Newly renovated homes are just hot property when it comes to real estate investment at the moment. But with hot property, it becomes a hot price tag. And so what we're seeing in the marketplace, believe it or not, Uh, There today are newly renovated properties selling more than the cost to build a new one, which defies logic, right? But actually, what we are seeing in certain marketplaces is the market is prepared to pay a premium for the right renovated asset in the marketplace rather 
than go through a renovation or a build. Now, as a property investor, we've got to look into the details on that. And of course, the reason most people don't want to renovate or build is it's painful. It's a painful experience. As a property investor, though, sometimes we have to buy pain. That is the purpose of a, of a property investment. Now, I have been looking down in Adelaide, just at a few things floating around out there. Um, I haven't put my foot on anything at the moment, but I was looking at a recently renovated sort of newer build property, which um, sold for six fifty five. dollars uh, the same property to build from scratch is around five ninety five. dollars So there's a $60,000 premium on not actually doing the renovation or the build. Pretty crazy, right? Because obviously as a property investor, we can look at that two ways. We can go, well, one is convenient. Um, the other maybe make us a little bit of money, but a far more inconvenient approach in other words, finding a similar property and renovating it or actually building. So uh, there's no right or wrong. Today, I don't want to have what is right, what is wrong conversation. I'm just explaining really what is unfolding. Now, of course, supply levels are very, very low in real estate around Australia. And of course, one of the uh, reasons you're starting to see this flex of people paying for a highly renovated almost new property or highly renovated architectural property and paying more than uh, the brand new marketplace is just that. It's it, it's ready. It's ready to go. And if you can find them, um, I think they'd make a great investment. That is for sure when it comes to the lifespan of the asset, the depreciation value of the asset, the uh, un you know, the, the need not to add capital costs to those investments. The second, uh, I guess, thing which is unfolding is renovation. Renovation and extending properties, making them bigger. Obviously, spatial transformation has come along off the back of COVID-19. A lot more people are doing more things at home where they live. They need a Zoom room. They need a home office. They need more space because two people are of working from home, they realize all of a sudden they don't have enough natural light. So all of a sudden they need a new window. Uh, Renovations are unfolding and uh, the renovation boom, if you like, is uh, like we're, we're midway through the storm of the renovation boom. There are so many renovations unfolding and home extensions when it comes to the real estate marketplace. Now, there are really two structural reno- uh, two types of renovation. You've got structural and cosmetic. Structural renovations, because they're quite uh, expensive, they quite often need development applications, they need a lot of work, if you like. You need an architect, you need design plans. These type of renovations, if you like, for the most part, people are overcapitalizing. This is where a lot of the media is jumping on this kind of stuff because uh, the cost blowout on large scale renovations at the moment are quite significant. And one of the challenges with large scale sort of, or, you know, structural renovations is for the builder, quite often they don't have a set of blueprints to work off. So they're kind of discovering things as they go. I don't know if you've ever had anyone, I don't know, come over to your house and, you know, they think they're just replacing a tap and then the tap leads to a pipe and the pipe leads to something over here. And next minute, you know, a $50 washer has gone to a thousand dollar problem because of the way homes are, are designed. So when you're redesigning and renovating a property, there's a lot of things you uh, don't budget for. And so what we are seeing is when a home is renovated off the back of someone else's dirty work, people are prepared to pay a premium because people don't want to go through that. People don't want to uh, go through that sort of miscellaneous cost profile of structural renovations. They are blowing out at the moment. And of course, a lot of that is to do with Uh, the way supply chain economics is working at the moment, which we'll touch on. So the second form of renovation 
which I do, and I do it as part of the 4X growth plan, but I turn it into the 5th X. In other words, I buy well, good location, good market, great behaviors, and then I renovate all the way through a property cycle at the end. For me, renovation is the end process of buying a property well, well into my 15th, my 20 year of owning a property. I personally don't... uh, go through the process of buying a property and then adding capital cost to it to renovate. I just don't do it. It's not my thing. Uh, Certainly other people can do it. I don't do it. So cosmetic improvements are pretty common in Australia. And I've alluded to this in a past podcast. We see on average a property bought in Australia, uh, the average person who buys a property then goes and spends around sixty-three dollars to $73,000 improving that property. And so some homes, if you like, have had five or six iterations of this improvement. Um, some homes though, or some properties or dwellings, if you like, are uh, not or haven't been through that process. So when people buy those assets, they have to factor in that those properties need some TLC. And so the average TLC cost is around $63,000. Because when you think about it, you know, renovating a kitchen, you know, 20 to 30, uh, bathrooms can be 16 to 50. Um, And then you've got other things like if you wanted to, um, you know, renovate garages, it can be like 25,000 to um, turn them into, you know, some sort of Um, extra study and things like that. So renovations aren't necessarily cheap. And uh, there is some good reports out there that the average property, if you like, um, has to have around $60,000 to $70,000 worth of money spent on up on it. And the reason you would do that as a property investor, by the way, is to maximize the yield. You want to maximize your rental return or your cash flow profile. Without the cash flow, What happens? Tension. Tension happens. Remember the starting uh, place for a property investor, then there's tension, then there's the end place. And of course, 75% of real estate, whether it new, whether it old, it's just rubbish, right? And so of course it needs uh, work on it because it is dysfunctional to begin with. So much real estate out in the marketplace is dysfunctional. There's actually more capital than good properties when it comes to real estate. Hence why good properties do really, really, really well uh, from a capital growth value proposition. So if you're studying secondhand properties and you're out in the marketplace, you've got to go old plus 63,000. Like in, in other words, the value of the asset plus the capital cost. On average, uh, reports and research show it's around sixty to seventy thousand dollars. Personally, I like um, teaching the ten thirty rule, and I've talked about the ten thirty rule a few times on this show. Every ten years, factor in thirty grand. Uh, if a property is fifty years old and it's never had any improvements, um, you know you could be up for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in capital costs to improve that asset. So one of the biggest mistakes property investors make is they don't do the mathematics fairly on real estate. They don't buy an older property, then uh, attribute the capital cost expenditure to improve the asset to maximize the yield. They buy the old property, uh, assume no extra capital costs, uh, and kick the can down the road, which is a different strategy. And we'll talk about that strategy. So as a property investor, you know, at the end of the day, there's no right or wrong. I'm just telling you what's going on. Highly renovated properties, people are paying a premium for them. That means you're going to pay a premium for them. You're going to pay uh, for the real estate in one way, shape or form. You can renovate, but you probably want to avoid major structural renovations at the moment because of the cost of labor, the cost of build, and the uncertainty of a solid starting position. If you're going to buy secondhand properties, I 100% encourage the 1987 rule. 
Now, unless the property is architecturally interesting, it's Federation, it's, uh, you know, Georgian, it's, uh, um, you know, a postmodern home, it's got some sort of, you know, art deco, some sort of architectural uh, stimulus to make the asset interesting. You want if it's if it's kind of just built out in the 1960s and there's nothing interesting out of it. Like most real estate after the 1960s, there's nothing interesting about it. If it's not an architecturally interesting home, architecturally interesting apartment, uh, townhome, whatever it may be, then you want to probably factor in the 1987 rule. And of course, the 1987 rule is all about the ability to write off and depreciate assets. And again, like if we're going to go through this concept of uh, buying an old property and applying uh, capital costs, we probably still want some renovation, right? And again, like the 1987 rule is a is a powerful rule. Um, the 1987 rule, if you like, is that properties built after 1987, as in 1988-89, um, actually there is building depreciation. But there's not chattel depreciation if you don't buy brand new. So I'll just quickly kind of talk about that. Chattel depreciation just simply means depreciation on fixtures and fittings, right? So... Uh, Let's just talk about what that actually looks like. Let's look at a apartment that was built in 1986. It's before 1987. So you can't really depreciate anything. Under the old depreciation schedule rules, um, pre-budget 2017, you could diminish some shuttles, but not the building. Now, uh, you fundamentally, if a property is built before 1986 or 1987, basically, um, in 1986, um, you're not getting any cash flow from that asset. You're not getting any depreciation from that property whatsoever. You're not getting any shadow depreciation. There's nothing you're getting from that asset. If we were to look at a property built in the year 2000 for $850,000, an apartment, uh, you today um, can probably depreciate up to around $61,000 worth of allowances. $61,000 worth of allowances. So there's a bit of built-in buffer. Now, remember the 1030 rule. The 1030 rule is for every 10 years, we're probably going to spend about 30 grand to update our property, keep it interesting to the market, maximize our rental returns, that type of thing. Um, obviously, if something was built in the year 2000, it's kind of 20 years old. So there's probably about $60,000 worth of improvement, whether it be just refreshing the kitchen, whether it be new carpet, new paint, new blinds, new fixtures, new fittings, you're probably going to um, have to factor in a little bit of improvement, whether it's the full 60 or 30 to 60. Uh, You are, however, getting around $60,000 worth of depreciation. So can you see how the two link? One, uh, you're getting depreciation and of course you're having to spend pretty much all of the depreciation you're going to get to re-emphasize or rejuvenate the asset. Not such a bad play, not the maximalist play you can do, but is not the worst thing out there in the marketplace, as long as you go and do it. Then if we looked at a brand new apartment, uh, let's say it was uh, $850,000, you're getting full depreciation. And actually, you're not only getting building depreciation, you're also getting... Uh, shadows depreciation. So you're getting a full um, lifespan of the depreciation. So using standard uh, depreciation calculators, that throws out 10 years worth of savings or $135,000 worth of allowances over a 10 year period. So what you can see from that is good cash flow. This is good cash flow management. Remember, there's only so much money floating around. And as Robert Kiyosaki famously says, we've only got so many $100 bills in our back pocket. 
Depreciation allowance is a really key way to cash flow ourselves. Now, of course, I'm a big fan of the longevity of real estate is built around cash flow management. People hold real estate longer if they're not biting into their back pocket. Remember, a lot of the tension at the moment in real estate is the talk about of money being stripped out of people's back pockets. If you can avoid that, then you don't really care about what is going on. Um, I've got a lot of positive cash flow real estate, and I really don't care what is going on in the news because interest rates could not affect my loan to value ratio versus my cash to and income profile on those uh, on those properties. They're just too far ahead of the game to give a brass razoo about what is going on when it comes to the tensions in the world. However, a lot of other people are tense and that fundamentally messes their uh, their psychology up with within real estate. And a lot of that then impacts their social life, their married life, their uh, well-being because we we carry this stuff and we uh, quite often behave. Money creates strange behaviors inside people. Um, all of a sudden, pressures, home life pressures. So it's real for people, right? And again, one of the best ways to avoid that is a bit of depreciation because you put in your depreciation plus your rent and you end up in a pretty good position. And here's a little cheeky tip. If you're PAYG, you can actually claim your depreciation and do your taxes actually uh, using a PAYG variation. Um, You know, you don't have to wait to the end of the financial year. You can speak to your bookkeeper and get some of that cash flow rolling in. So the ATO is not using your money, you're using your money. And uh, quite often, most property investors don't do that because they're not good cash flow managers and they kind of kick the can down the road till the end of tax time and get a lump sum return or money back. If you need uh, more stability in your financial world, you can claim your tax weekly using a a tax variation um, element. And so a lot of people don't do this. This is, this is the, the cornerstone of kind of property investment, right? Like, um, Again, the 1987 rule is a big, big rule in my in my world because properties built fundamentally 1986, 1985, 1984, all the way to the 1960s. Like, uh, if you're you 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 know you're not getting enough income out of those assets if you're paying a premium for them and they're not newly renovated right? You don't want to have to go and renovate that stuff and throw capital costs into it. Uh, Maybe if there's a a quick little profit to make, but otherwise, you know, potentially you just, um, you know, you just, you just got to make a business decision what's right for you. So we've been through renovating, we've been through uh, buying, uh, paying a premium for a renovated property Now, uh, let's talk about kicking the can down the road. A lot of people use this strategy. They're like, well, I'm going to buy a property, but I actually didn't realize there was a thing called capital costs, which you've got to factor in. And uh, of course, I can't depreciate any money out of the property, so it's not providing optimum cash flow. Uh, And yes, now I realize that the property actually, if it wanted maximum cash flow and wanted to be a premium asset to the rest of the market, like a premium renovated property, I have to go and spend money. And so a lot of people go, well, I'm just going to delay that and um, that'll be my plan. And of course, that plan's got um, some dark sides to it, which of course is cash flow. You're not getting the optimum amount of cash flow. Uh, And quite often people will go, well, I'll buy the asset, but I'll factor in a renovation down the track. And that's great if the asset gives you maybe 25 years renovation free. However, if the asset really does need an upgrade, cosmetically, new paint, new kitchen, new bathroom, uh, 
you know, it, it needs it or it's five years away from it. Um, you're fundamentally still got the same problem other people have when it comes to the inflation of bills, the f- inflation of renovation. You're just actually not dealing with it. You're moving the process further down the track. Again, no right or wrong. You just got to know that down the track, you're probably going to pay more for the same renovation you could do today. So let's take a $90,000 renovation, apply a 5% uh, average inflation rate. Build inflation is higher than generally CPI. The same build to do in 2032 as opposed to 2022. 2022, the building renovation amount is $90,000. The building renovation amount or the renovation amount in 2032 is $146,000. You're going to pay for the problem. It's just when you pay for the problem. You're not going to avoid the problem. If you never do it and you then sell, you're fundamentally going to uh, basically pay for the problem the day you sell. In other words, someone's going to look at your asset and go, This property is falling apart. I'm not paying a premium for a falling apart property. I'm going to discount the property as to what its potential is. So you're fundamentally uh, just kicking the can down the road. So as we can see, there's really no way to magically avoid any of this stuff, whether we uh, 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 renovate, cosmetically, renovate structurally, kick the can down the road, or actually even build, which we'll talk about, uh, other than buying basically uh, brand new or brand newly renovated, we can't avoid the inflation cost. That's just, it's just built into real estate. And again, it's, it's, up to you to mathematically work out how to make real estate feasible. Um, I'm a big believer in teaching there are four risks and four gaps to real estate. The four risks, if you like, um, the worse the asset, the higher the risk, that's natural. Um, the worse, uh, The worst state of repair the asset is, the highest the risk, that's natural, right? That's just the way it works. And of course, The four risks and gaps in real estate are insurance risk, liquidity risk, operational risk, capital cost risk, the location gap, the disinvestment gap, the market gap, and the tenant gap. Now, if you are new, you wouldn't have done episode 99. If you want to do the the risks and gaps, go listen to episode 99. I think it's called the eight risks of real estate. You'll learn all about risks and gaps of real estate. So obviously there's a building boom going on and a lot of that is around new construction inside the real estate marketplace. 75% of new builds out in the marketplace, in my opinion, are rubbish, they're junk. Um, Most real estate is supply of new real estate is is properties people don't even want to live in. Um, 25% of it though is properties that people do want to live in. And if you can find those properties in suburbs where people want to live in, that's a good thing. There's new stock. uh, It's available. It's in the right place, in the right street, in the right neighborhood. Uh, It's rather like a newly renovated property. Same kind of principle. Makes a lot of sense. The only drama with it, and we're going back to this kind of, we've got a starting place, we've got an end place, and in the middle is the tension, which is the builds at the moment. And again, like for builders, generally speaking, um, cosmetic renovations, very simple for them. Structural renovations, very difficult for them. And then uh, standard builds are very simple for for most renovate, uh, sorry, most builders, like licensed builders, because they've got a solid set of plans and blueprints from the architect to work off. Like it's it's a pretty simple process. They're not encountering something because kind of nothing exists, if you like. 
And so um, generally speaking, uh, building the right new property in the right neighborhood is is perfectly fine as a property investor. Um, again, like a lot of the rhetoric about new versus old, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you can find a property in the right neighborhood, the right area, whether it's new, whether it's old, you just got to work out how you're going to approach it. But you can't skimp. Um, and the more property investors skimp, and things like capital costs, renovating, or even designing a property right from the get-go as a new build, um, the more trouble they tend to find themselves in. And if you look at the building industry, a lot of the builders that have been financially impacted of recent times that can't finish renovations, that are uh, fundamentally going into receivership, uh, they've been pricing things and not making any money. They've just been running poor business models. And of course, some of the um, businesses which are kind of too big to fail, if you like, um, have got a lot of money to capital inject into their into their businesses, right? So obviously, um, when you choose to build new, like you've got to uh, weigh up the marketplace, right? And probably the worst time to build is actually a period of high supply. In other words, no buyers, but a lot of stock is being produced. High supply marketplaces. Now, right now we're in a low supply marketplaces. There's lots of buyers and there's not enough stock being produced to keep up with the buying appetite. Obviously, uh, a lot of that has unfolded over the last two years during the low rate environment of COVID. Um, and a lot of the builds which people undertook over the last two years are still being worked through, which is quite an interesting science. But probably more risky than potentially build inflation, in other words, paying an extra $10,000, $30,000 for a build or a renovation is supply itself. Like it's actually worse to uh, renovate, if you like, or even build brand new when supply is very, very, very high in the marketplace because you're just adding to a glut of stock, which is eventually going to come back in price. So Though the conversation around building and renovating and stuff, um, certainly from the media's perspective, is great clickbait, it's actually, uh, when you think about it, count to, to intuitively, uh, there is no stock being produced. There is no oversupply being thrown upon the marketplace. So if you can control uh, a renovation or a build, uh, you will join the premium section in the marketplaces where people are paying a premium for that kind of stock. Um, and really, you know, besides the fact that things cost more, uh, everything costs more. So um, you can either kick the costs down the road, but you're going to get the bill for that and avoid the cost, which is potentially the best thing for you to do, or you can just embrace the costs and move on and just be aware that you're actually renovating or building in a marketplace which is devoid of stock. Now, I just had a look um, of a Charter Keck Kramer report of the production of apartments in Melbourne. Melbourne's said to be Australia's biggest city. I don't know. I was just down there. It was great. I was um, uh, having a good uh, night out down in Melbourne and – you know, it's a big city, isn't it? It's a 5 million people in Melbourne. It's a um, pretty robust place. I love going there. Uh, but if you look at stock levels off the Charter Keck report, um, you know, you can go back to sort of call it 2016, really 2014 to 2000 and first quarter 2017, you were getting around – call it 6,000 apartments every three months being built, right? 6,000. So in one year, you would have uh, 25,000 apartments built in Melbourne, 2014. Then 15, it was, 
you know, 30,000 and then 16, it was 30,000 and 70. So over a four year period, you had like a hundred thousand apartments being built. And so the glut of buying in, in new construction to that space was, uh, you know, would have been, would have withheld your investment back. Now, there was no boom, so you wouldn't have had to pay a premium to build, but you were sitting in a glut if you um, had an asset like an apartment in the Melbourne space between really uh, quarter one 2014 to quarter one 2017. Then uh, supply fell away, and, and we know why, obviously, APRA stopped people buying real estate. And, of course, now we've had a pandemic and everything – that was built is bought and now there is not enough to go around. And so amazingly, if we were to look at uh, the quarter um, one 2022 figures, there's not 6,000 apartments being built like in 2015. There's around 500 in Melbourne. Uh, if you go back the quarter before that, it was about uh, about 800. A quarter before that, about 250. Um, and so it's quite easy to understand that, of course, like people leave home, like, you know, people finish high school. They want to go on in rent somewhere or they, you know, want to leave the nest, like 5 million people and you've got a couple of hundred apartments being built. That is a crisis. And so obviously anyone building a home or renovating or um, uh, building into that crisis has uh, less of a problem than buying into a glut, which was all the way back in 2014. That was a, that was a, a, a probably a, a worse uh, decision than it is to buy where you're engaging a builder in a booming um, building landscape, right? Because the underlying asset of real estate is the land, is the thing you're building upon. And there is a diminishing amount of that unfolding. Hence why people will pay a premium for uh, a basically a newly renovated asset because no one wants to go through that. No one wants to build, no one wants to renovate. Uh, and so it sounds sexy, but no one wants to do it because it's a pain in the ass. And again, when you're a property investor, you just got to buy problems and deal with it, right? And again, if you deal with the problems, you come out the other side better for it. And, you know, um, you just you just got to work with the flow, right? Now, I recently... Uh, got my team to examine the real estate marketplace just to see from an affordability point of view, like with no stock being produced, even though there's all these builds happening, which is kind of blows your mind, right? There is just no stock. It's, it's all accounted for. And uh, because of the building boom, uh, you've like, you, you're, you're unable to produce more. So there's kind of this relationship. If the boom hadn't happened, you wouldn't have had the build boom in building costs. Uh, so if there was no boom, there would be no extra cost in renovating or building. Um, there is a boom, so there's an extra cost in renovating or building. It's just the way it works, right? After expansion comes contraction. After contraction comes expansion. And again, the more you try and sort of, um, you know, be fearful of what's going on. Like I guarantee you in 2023, 2024, there'll be something else everyone is talking about. But Australia real estate values have jumped and it's not no, not necessarily just building costs that have jumped. The real cost of what has jumped is the price of dirt, the price of, uh, of locations. They have all jumped in value. And again, like if you look at, the my housing market May 2022 medium house price, and you're probably listening, you know, to this um, in uh, July. I'm recording it in June, so I've gone back a month. Um, you know, like wow, like Sydney's, you know, basically one and a half million dollars to buy a house. Uh, Melbourne, 
you know, 960. Brisbane, 820. Adelaide, 720. Perth, 620. So, like, a lot of people who could afford it have, have got their assets, but now you've got this sort of situation where, um, like, there's no stock. And so I categorize stock as extinct, clinically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, low, okay, solid, or plentiful, okay? And if you want to understand, um, you know, really extreme, uh, the, the extreme nature of real estate, extremistan, I've done an episode on extremistan. Um, I will give you the episode number if you like um, and see if you guys want to backtrack and listen to it. In that episode, I kind of said like, Brisbane middle ring housing and townhousing will be extinct if you don't act. And lo and behold, uh, it is now actually extinct. Um, and again, like that is, uh, what is that? The extinction of property investors is coming. Um, it's that episode, whatever episode that was, 15th of December, 2021. It's extinct, right? So let's go through it. Uh, Inner city apartments under 675, basically newly renovated or new. Um, Brisbane extinct, Melbourne endangered, Sydney extinct, Newcastle extinct, Canberra extinct, Perth extinct. Uh, Whether you look at it from, uh, you can buy old and add the capital costs, whether you look at it new and you depreciate or whether you look at it as newly renovated, it's extinct. It doesn't exist. Uh, if you look at, uh, for example, middle ring housing, whether it's, you know, 600, but then you factor in the capital costs, whether it's 700 and uh, like 800 and new and you depreciate whether like, uh, if we looked around Australia today and we looked in the middle ring for a brand new property or a property where you can um, buy it and and factor in the capital costs uh, under six seventy five, Brisbane extinct, Melbourne extinct, Sydney's been extinct for forever, uh, Newcastle extinct, Canberra extinct, Perth extinct, Adelaide extinct. Uh, again, like th- this is this is w- what I'm kind of talking about, like. Like, like you are in a position where the market, the, the value of assets have improved so much that, again, we're probably focusing on the wrong part. Now, again, I think the best part to focus on is if you can get into a really good location at the right price, you, <clears throat> you do the right maths, whether it's new, old, whether you're building or renovating, you, you know, you've got to make your move because uh, you've just got to do the maths correctly is all I'm saying. If it's old, you add capital costs. If it's new, you, you know, you, you, you also factor in where it sits in the marketplace. You've got to do your research. You've got to do your due diligence. But we, we are seeing the obliteration of real estate. We are seeing the obliteration of price-sensitive real estate in the marketplace. And again, when you really analyze the biggest problem in real estate, it's supply. There's no supply of it. Um, hence why, obviously, rates are on the move to dampen the mood. Maybe that will start to bring a bit of balance back to the situation. So if you are buying into the new section of the market, I've got some tips. Um, First one is land bankers are very good. Um, Companies which have owned uh, land for a long period of time where they can, um, you know, offset some of the costs of development, um, you know, and it's not uncommon to still see new properties priced equal to or even less than secondhand properties because quite often people don't want to be part of the build process. Again, more buyers will go to the secondhand marketplace buying uh, than they will to the uh, construction marketplace. It's just the way it is, right? It doesn't necessarily mean once it's constructed that people won't go to that asset. Remember, the characteristics of real estate are important. Good land, 
good location, good quality of asset. So one power move is to to analyze where people have been land banking and see if there is any development going on and make sure it's good stock. Um, obviously, builder developers are a good way to um, also look at the new build uh, section of the marketplace. And also, you know, personally, I also go down the road of who cares, so what? Uh, so certain real estate is just so beautiful and so well designed and in such an incredible location and it's carrying a premium. So what? Who cares? Like it's 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 so uh, amazing that I'd rather just buy that real estate for long-term growth than um, float around in uh, a weird, icky, gopnik um, kind of place. So demand pushes prices on everything and uh, you can't have one without the other. And so though things seemingly are costing more, um, there's been there's been movement. And again, you cannot push the reset button on where we are going with real estate. It is where it's at. And a lot of that is to do with um, the space that has been created off the back of COVID. Uh, when it comes to the cost to renovate and the cost to build, I mean, builders are not doing uh, escalations on purpose. Uh, they've got had lockdowns. They've had supply chain issues, you know, lack of ships moving um, cargo. They've had supply chain breakdowns in overseas places. They've had... Um, you know, all sorts of things happen. And and I think we all see it, right? Like we all go to the restaurant and you know, things take longer because there's only one chef, not two. And there's, you know, th- there's just people missing from society. And so if you are going to renovate or build, you've just got to factor into your cost that things are going to take longer. Um, things are potentially going to cost a little bit more. Um, and, Again, like when we when we sometimes think about this stuff and if you kind of watch, I don't know, like some of these kind of TV shows that are out there, you know, it, it sometimes portrayed that renovations are so cheap and cheerful and then if you watch the news, it's like, oh my God, like everyone's um, struggling and it's just this kind of horrible place, if you like. Um, and really, you know, for the most part, most builders – are running a really good set of businesses and most renovators as well. And there's consumer protection around this. There's uh, watchdogs that look at the financials of of companies and builders and things like that. And of course, there is, if you are doing, for example, a new build in, say, housing, there is uh, things like how insurance and so forth. Now, it would be horrible to go through a builder being unable to finish their build on your pro on your property, um, that would not be a good thing at all. And so, really, you should do some, um, uh, you know, research on on anyone renovating or building that you're working with. You don't want to renovate it to break down halfway and and take your money and all that kind of stuff. But for the most part, that's that's just you know there are good reliable trades out there, and I think um you know too much kicking is going on for good hard working tradies out there you know doing some great work um extending homes renovating homes and building homes right so again there's trade offs with everything and uh i'd say that probably the worst time to renovate or build is when supply levels are really really high um premiums are being paid for uh, again, newly renovated properties. So uh, think about that. Can the mathematics work your end? Um, and, you know, if uh, you are doing a build and um, you are, uh, you know, fundamentally going through a process, uh, you've just got to, you know, play, as that, play it as it comes. But no doubt when you look at the maths, potentially if you've been building over the last 12 months or 18 months, uh, it's possible you've got a variation of 10 grand or 20 grand or something, but your asset has gone up 100 or 150 grand or even more, right? Um, so real estate at the end of the day comes down to the underlying asset, right? The underlying asset is is the dirt, is 
is the location is that that is what the real estate is intrinsically about by providing better uh, shelter you just get better cash flow so the actual dwelling is the cash flow component the uh, land if you like is the growth component so just think of it that way right and so hopefully you can you know go through this process have a bit of a think about what's the right thing for you to do um you know i think when it comes to all of this stuff excuse me gotta have a drink of water when it comes to all this stuff i think we tend to over dramatize what is going on over you know the course of a year and fundamentally most property investors do they tend to under underestimate what you can achieve in sort of 10 or 15 years in real estate like uh i you know bought real estate in you know, middle of the gfc like wow like i you know, can't even really i mean other than doing this podcast there's no, like i wouldn't wake up remembering that would i uh so maybe we should have a uh you know, a party in 2032 about this episode and say, well, did anyone really care what happened in 2022 when they were renovating or building a property? Uh, no, right? Probably then we'll have to talk to the people that kick the can down the road. How was that experience kicking the can down the road to 2032? Is your $90,000 renovation now $146,000? Which, uh, again... Uh, is just part of the tension of real estate. Remember, we've got a starting point, a tense point, and an end point. Most of the middle bit around real estate is tension. And so we just got to work through that tension. I'm doing some renovations at the moment, working through that tension. I was speaking to a colleague of mine. Um, she bought two properties, uh, doing two builds in Northbridge, which is a gun place in Sydney. The builder is to, like already a year late on the property. Uh, the land, though, has, you know, it's gone up so much. She's just made so much actually doing that type of uh, process. So it does soften uh, the problem of, you know, escalated costs, whether you're renovating or building. And I think we've just got to be mindful that, um, you know, if we're making money, we're making money. If we make a bit, little bit less, but we get things done, that's great as well. I think the biggest issue for property investors is just delivering something to market, whether it's a premium, highly renovated, beautiful property, whether it's a property which you've got to kick down the road, whether it's a property you've got to build or a property you've got to actually renovate. The decision's up to you, but there's no stock, so um, hold some because uh, the next phase of this thing called real estate, um, you know, should be a fun one. So talk soon. Uh, that's the end of the show. I'll catch you on the next one uh, as we do it. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.